Chapter 9 Sowing Bountifully 2 Corinthians 9 verses 1 to 2 For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. It is superfluous, it was unnecessary for him to write unto them further, but Paul had reason to doubt the people of Corinth would follow through on their pledge to give which they had made a year ago. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 3 to 4 Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, ye may be ready, lest haply if they of Macedonia come with me, and find you unprepared, we, that we say not, ye, should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. Paul sent men, Titus included, to help the Corinthians gather their love offering in advance of the other men arriving as representatives from other churches so they would not be embarrassed that they hadn't even collected the offering yet that they had promised a year ago. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 5 Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you, and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before, that the same might be ready, as a matter of bounty, and not as of covetousness. And make up beforehand your bounty. These men would gather the offering before Paul arrived so they would not have to have an offing taken in a hurry. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. This letter was meant as a sermon to be read in the church at Corinth. This would take the burden off of its leadership, which was dealing with a lot of issues, and this letter, if received, would alleviate those problems. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. As he purposeth in his heart, this is what is known as grace purpose giving. It was a special offering for a specific need. It was not an outline on how we are to support the local church on a regular basis, but principles can be had from this account that definitely apply. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 8 to 9 And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work, as it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. Psalm 112 verse 9 He hath dispersed, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness endureth forever, His horn shall be exalted with honor. God is able to make all grace abound toward you. God remembers those who give sacrificially when they are in need later on, and He remembers the opposite as well. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 10 to 11 Now he that ministereth seed to the sower both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness winky face. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. He that ministereth seed to the sower, God is the one who administers the necessary seed to the sower by putting a burden upon the heart of those who have to give to those that have. If you are not a sower of what you have been given, you will not be blessed with more seed to sow. Multiplying your seed sown, the Corinthians would also be enriched by their obedience to God moving in their hearts to be a part of the work by multiplying their blessings from Him. God does not forget our labor of love and he rewards those that get involved in his work. 2 Corinthians 9 verses 12 to 14 For the administration of this service not only supplieth the one of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God, whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayer for you which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. The one of the saints, the Corinthians would be blessed spiritually by the saints in Jerusalem who would glorify God for their deliverance. Their prayer for you, the poor saints in Jerusalem would remember the Corinthians favorably in their prayers, who had they not gotten involved in the relief project, the saints in Jerusalem would not have had any reason to get to know the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 15 Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. His unspeakable gift, 
This is the gift of God of eternal life mentioned in Romans 6 verse 23. Chapter 10 Paul's Boasting 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1 Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. When Jesus walked this earth, he was approachable, as was Paul. Little children loved him because he was truly humble. I am bold toward you. Paul's words were meek and gentle at times, but they were also bold towards those who were in rebellion against the truth. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 2 But I beseech you, that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Paul didn't want to have to be bold when he was with them, because some hadn't yet repented of their open sin. Paul was begging, beseeching, them to repent beforehand. As if we walked according to the flesh, some people thought Paul was walking, responding, in the flesh when they read his letters. He was telling them what he would do if they did not repent. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 to 4 For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We do not war after the flesh. Paul would do his battling not in the church by gathering a big crowd behind him and kicking everyone out that didn't agree with him that would be walking in the flesh, carnal. The weapons of our warfare. Paul would enter into the spiritual arena to do battle on his knees and though his letters that were written with the sharpest sword ever used in battle, the word of God. Paul was destined to win. The pulling down of strongholds, these are mostly doctrinal strongholds produced from seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Casting down imaginations, most battles for the believer take place in the mind long before they ever get to the flesh. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, pride and lust begin to do their work in the mind and if our thoughts are not brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, we are doomed to fail. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, how can we be victorious in our daily battles? Make it a habit of asking yourself when you are tempted, what does God's word say about this? If you don't know the answer to something, then wait a while and find out before listening to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 6 And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience, when your obedience is fulfilled. Having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience, Paul would not shirk his responsibility as the apostle of the Gentiles and overlook something that was hurting the church's testimony. Your obedience is fulfilled. This had to do with the offering that was being collected for the destitute kingdom believers back in Jerusalem who were suffering immensely. The Corinthians had agreed to give a gift, and Paul was reminding them they needed to honor their commitment to them. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 7 Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that, as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. There were those in Corinth who began to look down upon the Apostle Paul, because he was not as eloquent as the intellectuals of Corinth. Because Paul did not have their charisma or possess a beautiful voice, they began to criticize him as being out of touch, and that they knew better than Paul what they ought to do to serve God, after all they were Christians too. They had forgotten who Paul was to the body of Christ, and he reminds them as he defends his ministry in the next verses. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 8 to 9 For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Our authority, Paul did not want to use his office to bully anyone around and make them do what he said because he was the apostle of grace and not law. Romans 11 verse 13 For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 10 to 11 For his letters, say they, 
are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that, such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. Paul was telling the group in Corinth that thought he was bluffing about coming and setting things in order that regardless of his size and weakness he would be coming. He would be coming to battle with every weapon the Lord would provide to him including his office as the apostle of the Gentiles. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12 For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We dare not make ourselves of the number. Paul is not perfect, but he has a perfect Savior and God's word is perfect, and Paul knew he was standing upon God's word in this instance. Those who were comparing themselves in Corinth with other Christians and who were commending one another against the Apostle Paul were not wise. They would get what was coming to them if they chose to persist in their rebellion to Paul's apostolic authority. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 13 But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. Things without our measure. Paul said he was not overstretching his authority and he was not bragging in the least bit as were those he was speaking to. They remind me of those who spoke against Moses and said you are not the only one God speaks through. The earth opened up and swallowed them straight down to hell. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 14 For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reached not unto you, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Paul would only go as far as the Lord would allow in the area of finances. As more funds would come in Paul and those in Corinth would take the message to the regions beyond Corinth. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 15 to 16 Not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Not boasting of things without our measure, Paul started the church in Corinth and with every new believer that got saved after he left Paul's ministry was enlarged as well as theirs. And with time the gospel would naturally begin to expand in those areas. Paul did not boast of the growth as coming about because of his efforts although he could. Others were complaining because they thought Paul was taking credit for their efforts in the area. Paul was excited for the work of others in the area. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 17 to 18 But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Chapter 11 The Simplicity That Is In Christ 2 Corinthians 11 verses 1 to 2 Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed, bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Bear with me a little in my folly, Paul was saying. Let me be foolish for a moment while I explain something. Some have seen this verse and said, See the church is the bride of Christ. First of all, the term the bride of Christ is not mentioned in scripture. See all of Revelation 21. The bride of the Lamb is, however, found there. She is identified as the city of New Jerusalem. It is a very Jewish city with the number 12 found all over it. 12 is the number of Israel. I have espoused you to one husband. Paul looks upon the Corinthian believers as a father looks upon a daughter who is getting ready to be married. Paul had begotten the Corinthians through the gospel. He wants only what is best for his Corinthian children. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15 They were his children in the faith as Timothy was also his son in the faith. 1 Timothy 1 verse 2 When did their espousal take place? The moment they were saved. They became a part of Christ's body the moment they got saved. That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Notice Paul carefully chose the word as a similitude to describe them. The Corinthians were as a chaste virgin. 
How did they become as a chaste virgin? Colossians 1 verses 20 to 22 and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him too. Reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Paul took his ministry as the apostle of the Gentiles as serious as a loving father did his to his daughter, and he used a foolish similitude to explain his relationship to them and their relationship to God. The language can sound a bit confusing at first, but remember when you trusted Christ, you became one with him, you are literally in Christ. Paul used marriage language because it is a picture of salvation. How long are we saved for? How long is marriage supposed to last? Forever. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Genesis 3 The simplicity that is in Christ, salvation is simple because it is in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Legalists came in from Jerusalem and began to tell them how they needed more than what Paul gave them and since they came from Jerusalem many in Corinth believed them and even began to be ashamed of Paul. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4 For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Another Jesus, they preached the same Jesus, but in a different way. When Jesus came, he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and not to the Gentiles. He came under the law to redeem them that were under the law. He came and preached the gospel of the kingdom to a nation that was longing for the long-awaited kingdom to come. We today preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since before the world began, but which was revealed unto Paul to give unto the body of Christ, the church. There were those of the circumcision who were preaching Jesus Christ according to Israel's prophecy that was under the law. Galatians 4 verse 4 But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. The mystery program is Jesus Christ's heavenly ministry as the head of the body of Christ while the prophecy program is preaching Jesus Christ according to Israel's earthly kingdom program. Another spirit, obviously this is speaking of a seducing spirit. Another gospel, there were different gospels for the different programs. The gospel of the kingdom is associated with Israel's program, while the gospel of the grace of God is associated with the body of Christ. Galatians 2 verse 7 But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 5 to 6 For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. Paul was not behind any of the twelve, not even Peter. In fact, he was given more revelations than all of them and the people of Corinth were witnesses of Paul's knowledge. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 7 to 8 Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted, because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them, to do you service. I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. Some of the people who had corrupted them with the law also had letters commendation from Jerusalem. They were supported by the church in Jerusalem, and they challenged Paul's apostleship because Paul wasn't on the Jerusalem payroll. That kingdom church was now destitute, and it was relying on the Gentile churches to send relief back to Jerusalem of which Paul was leading the effort. These deceitful workers were no longer there in Corinth, but they had done their damage and had left just as soon as they had sown enough doubt in enough people's minds in Corinth to give Paul a hard time. Paul worked a secular job for 12 years prior to this time so that he would not be chargeable to the Corinthians and other ones as well. 
The poorest of churches supported Paul financially while the richest churches never even thought about helping him. I robbed other churches. This should have floored them in Corinth to be told something they should have seen all along. Paul knew that this church was a carnal church and to add to it the responsibility to support its founder would just add to their problems. He willingly suffered for them. The deed was never reciprocated back to Paul by them. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 9 And when I was present with you, and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. When I was present with you and wanted, Paul had great needs while he was ministering to these saints, but he did not make any demands of those new believers in Corinth because he didn't want them to think he was in it for the money. All the while, the more spiritually mature church in Macedonia continually gave to the Apostle Paul's needs even though they were a poor church and Corinth was a very wealthy church. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 10 to 12 As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. The very same people who claimed they came from God and that Paul was not with them became dependent upon Paul and the Gentile churches that he established for their very survival. Paul cared enough to not allow this church to defile itself with this false teaching concerning the lost position in the church in this age of grace and the Gentiles. Requirements concerning it. They were not under the law, and they never were. Romans 6 verses 14 to 15 For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15 For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. False apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, they transformed themselves into apostles. An apostle was a sent one. They sent themselves. These false apostles from Jerusalem claimed that Paul was a false apostle because he was not sent out from them, nor supported by them. Paul points out that it is they who were the ones preaching the wrong message to the wrong people. They were not preaching it to the lost sheep of the house of Israel as they were supposed to still be doing while Israel's kingdom hopes were still being offered. They were taking their message of law out to the Gentiles where it didn't belong. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He can change. His ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, seducing spirits with doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 16 to 18 I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly, in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. Paul's hand was forced here in that he now had to parade his credentials before them because of these troublemakers attacking his apostleship and he called it foolishness. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 19 to 21 For ye suffer fools gladly, seeing ye yourselves are wise. For ye suffer, if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Paul was explaining to the Corinthian hearers that all the things that these Judaizers were claiming as their credentials to be their teachers, that he had them beat in every area. 
Then he tells them that if he were to come there bragging of his credentials it would be foolish and then using them to run someone else down would be a reproach to God and his work. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 22 Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Paul's sufferings. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 24 Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Paul is saying it is useless for people to spend time bragging about what they had done for the cause of Christ in their life. Their emphasis should have been put on what Christ has done through them. Since they were successful in leading folks away from the simplicity that Paul taught them about in Christ, he now would have to list his credentials which were his sufferings. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 25 to 27 Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Paul lists, against his will, all the sufferings he endured, not all of his building projects, baptisms, and church attendance. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 28 to 31 Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Besides all that Paul daily had the care of all the churches that he had started on his mind and heart, just as he was pleading for the Corinthians he also pleaded for many others. 2 Corinthians 11 verses 32 to 33 In Damascus the governor under Aretas the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Paul recalled how that when he had just begun to minister God miraculously delivered him from the hands of his enemies when he could do nothing himself. God blinded the eyes of these soldiers while at the same time gave discernment to God's people as to how to get Paul out of there with his life. Paul gloried in his weakness of hiding in a basket because God in his strength chose a foolish basket to deliver him. Acts 9 verses 23 to 25 And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him, but their laying await was known of Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Chapter 12 The Messenger of Satan 2 Corinthians 12 verse 1 It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Paul had at least three visions of the risen Lord in which he had received revelations of the Lord according to scripture. It is stated here that there were more visions and revelations to come. There was the time of his calling on the road to Damascus, as well as the time when he was in the temple in Jerusalem and was told to get out of Jerusalem in a vision because the Jews would not hear him. Paul wanted to stay in Jerusalem and convince his own people and he thought he was the best person for the job because he had recently been the church's greatest enemy, but God knew better. The third time was while he was imprisoned where he received further revelations concerning the mystery program. These are called his prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. These could have all been received at different times. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 2 I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth winky face such an one caught up to the third heaven. I knew a man in Christ, the man was in Christ. Both kingdom saints and grace saints were both in Christ. 
just in a different way. Kingdom saints were to abide in Christ. We are in his body, the church. Above 14 years ago, the timing is important here, so find out where Paul was, what he was doing, and with whom he was and you can narrow down the list of who it may have been, but scripture narrows it down to only one person I believe. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Paul is stating that he doesn't know if this person was in their physical body or caught up in a vision. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, the third heaven is a reference to that which is beyond both the first, earth's atmosphere, and second heaven, outer space. The third heaven is the place where the throne of God is and where we as believers go to at the moment of death. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 3 to 4 And I knew such a man, whether in the body, or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth winky face. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Whether in the body, or out of the body, I cannot tell. Paul repeats himself in back-to-back -back verses like in Romans 6 verse 14 and 15 because what he is saying is important for us to understand. He was caught up into paradise. Paradise is where the kingdom saints went when they died. Since paradise was now in heaven, hell could enlarge itself. Isaiah 5 verse 14 Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. John is the only person according to the scriptures that the Paul knew who fits the description perfectly. Paradise is mentioned only two other times in scripture, and paradise is referred to here as being somewhere in the third heaven. Paul, as a member of the body of Christ, would not go to paradise when he died, but to the presence of the Lord in heaven. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 5 Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, Twice Paul says he will not glory except in his infirmities or weaknesses, verse 9, so the very words of Paul himself prove to us that he is not speaking of himself, but of another, if words have any meaning at all. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 6 For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. It is a natural thing for our flesh to want to glory in itself or to receive glory from others, but all that is foolish when God is the one deserving the glory. Paul was right in correcting any errors these people were spreading concerning his office as the apostle of the Gentiles. Because of the natural tendency to glory in the flesh when you do something that will be seen by the public, Paul wanted to make sure they did not start to exalt him instead of God. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7 And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to befame me, lest I should be exalted above measure. The abundance of the revelations, all the mysteries concerning the body of Christ that were revealed to him. A thorn in the flesh, God allowed Satan to send a messenger to befame him that was comparable to a thorn in the flesh. Many people key on the word flesh and totally ignore the word messenger which denotes personality and the being that this messenger was sent by Satan. Three times Paul has had to deal with this problem at Corinth that exalted itself against Paul and his ministry even challenging Paul's authority there as an apostle. The messenger of Satan to befame me, the obvious conclusion is that Satan sent one of his ministering spirits to thwart the work of Paul in the area. These spirits are behind all the deception preached in every false organization that masquerades as a church of God. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 8 to 9 For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Was it a physical ailment such as his eyes? That is very possible. Was it something like a satanically lead opposition in the church at Corinth? That is also possible. 
But whatever it was doesn't really matter because the only thing that matters is that God's grace is sufficient to get us through anything we face in life, and it can also humble us if we need it. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10 Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Here we see Paul combining physical infirmities alongside of reproaches and persecutions among other things as things that God can use to keep us humble. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 11 I am become a fool in glorying, ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. I ought to have been commended of you. Paul tells them the position of honor he should have had in their eyes and hearts had they been obedient to God as their apostle. Because they were not obedient to God, they naturally would not be obedient to someone who would remind them of their sins. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 12 Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs, and wonders, and mighty deeds. The signs of an apostle, Paul spoke in tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 18, he raised a man from the dead, he cast out devils from those that were possessed, and he healed many people in his early ministry. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 13, for what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Paul reminds the rich Corinthian that while he was there, he didn't require them to financially support him which they should have, and he regrets not having them do so. They now felt no obligation to help the church in Jerusalem by sending them what they had originally promised. Paul felt partially to blame for that. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 14 Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. I seek not yours, but you. Paul knew some of his opposition would claim Paul was in the ministry for the money as a way to undermine his authority. Paul took that excuse away from them by telling them in advance that he wanted nothing from them but their obedience to God. He wanted to give to those who were acting like disobedient children towards him instead of receiving from them. The children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Paul was their father in the faith having begotten them through the gospel. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15 2 Corinthians 12 verse 15 And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. This is true in many areas of life. The food that is good for us many do not like. The medicines that will make us well often taste sickening. The words we need to hear sometimes never get uttered and when they are on rare occasions they are rarely followed. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 16 to 18 But be it so, I did not burden you, nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Being crafty, I caught you with guile. Paul asks the Corinthians to think back to what Paul had done for the church and to ask themselves, was Paul and his assistants trying to get gain for themselves while they were here? 2 Corinthians 12 verses 19 to 20 again, Think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. For I fear, lest, when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. The people needed to business with God and Paul had a calling from God to see that they were reconciled to God. Paul truly loved these people, even ones who despised him. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 21 And lest, when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Here is the root cause of their opposition to Paul. 
They had followed the world's example of lasciviousness and had refused to repent of it, so they began to attack the only person who would stand up against their sin, Paul. Chapter 13 Examine Yourselves 2 Corinthians 13 verse 1 This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Deuteronomy 19 verse 15 One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin in any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. This is the third time I am coming to you. Here Paul quotes an Old Testament precept where Moses was instructing the children of Israel. Christ also quoted the same verse in Matthew 18 verse 16 with regard to judgment in the kingdom. Nothing is said about Paul's second visit to Corinth, but it doesn't appear to have swayed the rebellious to repent and Paul was hoping they would get right with God and one another before he came. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 2 I told you before, and foretell you, as if I were present, the second time, and being absent now I write to them which heretofore have sinned, and to all other, that, if I come again, I will not spare. I will not spare. The guilty thought Paul was unable to do anything to them. The people of Corinth were challenging Paul because when they saw him last, they saw the frail frame of a man and somehow thought he would be afraid of their numbers. 2 Corinthians 13 verses 3 to 4 Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you, Lord, is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, while Paul was weak in the flesh, he reminds them that Christ was also weak in the flesh when he was crucified, but he was able to accomplish great things through his weakness. He was crucified through weakness, his flesh was human, and it was weak. He liveth by the power of God, he lives today by the power of God in the resurrection. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Paul was genuinely concerned for these people in the church because they saw no need of repentance for their deeds and even gloried in their rebellion and mocked the apostle of the Gentiles. Jesus Christ is in you. All saved people who have believed the gospel of the grace of God have Christ living inside them. Colossians 1 verse 27 To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Except ye be reprobates, a religious unbeliever who is still in his sin. 2 Corinthians 13 verses 6 to 9 But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad, when we are weak, and ye are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. Your perfection, Paul wanted the believers in the church to be spiritually complete, or mature. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 10 Therefore I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, and not to destruction. Paul did not want to be sharp with them and do more damage than good. When you write a letter there is more time to think and to choose your words more carefully. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 11 Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Be perfect. The word perfect means to be spiritually mature. 2 Corinthians 13 verses 12 to 14 Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost, be with you all. Amen. The second epistle to the Corinthians was written from Philippi, a city of Macedonia, by Titus and Lucas. Greet one another with an holy kiss. 
Paul is the only one who says this in scripture, and he does four times. Romans 16 verse 16 salute one another with an holy kiss. The church is of Christ salute you. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 20 All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with an holy kiss. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 26 Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. The communion of the Holy Ghost. All believers have the Holy Ghost residing in them, so they have that in common and it is a strong unifying factor. The second epistle to the Corinthians was written from Philippi, a city of Macedonia, by Titus and Lucas. Philippi was the city where Paul and his companions in the ministry were shamefully entreated. The End